I want to invite Andrew for the keynote. So uh, most of you are new, uh, so maybe you don't know Andrew, but you know Andrew is old in Istanbul as well, right? So <laughs> not your first time here. Let me get this one. No, that's mine. Oh, that's yours? OK. I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> you can draw, share. Is my mic on? Hello? Is it good? Good? Good night in Istanbul. Good night in. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this going. So there's a saying in English usually attributed to uh, Mark Twain that if I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. I also would have made it more Turkish. So if you, uh, I don't know what's going on. There we go. So, so last time, people have memories because I got up here and I was talking about Yanicheri and like all the uh, history. And I think there's a pretty good talk someone should give, maybe one of you, about the, uh, the significance of the, the trade. And, and I feel like you know, DevOps and platforms is all about trading between different cultures. But that's not the talk I'm going to give today. And I also was told, which I knew, there's a little bit of a language barrier, and I sometimes speak too fast for English speakers. So if you want to read my slides, I'll give them to the organizers, and then if you want to ask me questions, I'll explain it as slow as I can. So the timeless way is what I'm going to call this, and this is inspired by this book about architecture. And in this book, which is like a few hundred pages, took, took eight years to write. He argues that there's these patterns of building, timeless ways of building, thousands of years old, the same as it has always been. And, and I think if we look at the patterns of success and patterns of failure, because I'm going to show you some patterns of failure today, or at least what I consider failure, DevOps failures from a long time ago. All right, so the other alternative title for this is Learn Socio-Technical Systems the Hard Way. Has anyone used this terminology, socio-technical systems? No one, no one hears this? You, my people? The, the other instruction I've given is I, I should sip tea and make it conversational. <laughs> All right, so socio-technical systems, you're going to get a crash course in the history of the term socio-technical today. But first, I'm going to take you on a little, little thing. So for every, this is another, I like to quote random people. For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And I think that summarizes how most uh, vendors use the buzzwords to try to sell you their, their products. That's the guy who, who said that. So going on, a little bit about me. I'm not going to tell you my story, but I worked on a bunch of open source projects for a bunch of companies. I got to travel the world for the last 15 years and give talks about DevOps and worked on Puppet and worked on Cloud Foundry, worked on OpenStack, worked on Kubernetes projects for that time. I started a new uh, consulting company with some of my friends and we're focused on helping people think about the work. Instead of being a vendor that's coming and has to give you a product, like let's focus on how you actually need to get work done and then back into what you can do to do that. So this is our, this is our album cover for Ergonautic. And our, our tagline is stop chasing buzzwords, start working better. All right, so he, he said, you know, DevOps days and like the words. So I'm gonna give you a quick run through, like a history lesson of DevOps, the word. And sometimes people say silly things like this. They're like, you invented DevOps. It's like, no, no. Is that actually embarrassing when people say that? Because I didn't invent DevOps. I stole it. I stole it from my friends. This is maybe the most actionable advice you'll get today. Good DevOps copy, great DevOps steal. Which is a, is a, it's a quote, because uh, people say that about artists. And, and Steve Jobs says this too. So this, these are slides that came from a talk in uh, 2009. 
So this is velocity. I was in the audience. This is John Alspaugh and Paul Hammond. You can see their, their names. And they're giving this talk about how they do 10 deploys per day at Flickr. And at the time, that was like, <laughs> people's heads were exploding. 10 deploys per day, that's irresponsible. And, and then I think these are kind of funny and still sort of kind of true, right? So it's like the devs are a little bit weird, sit closer to the box, thinks too hard. And then the ops people are pulling knobs and easily excited, yell, yells a lot in emergencies. So pretty much the same. And I was in the audience and I was writing on Twitter, back when I thought Twitter was a good idea, <laughs> which changed <laughs> in the last few years. But I was just tweeting, you know, the things they were saying. Because um, I was lucky to, enough to be in the audience and I was in that circle, in that community of practice, talking about these things and solving these problems. There's a whole bunch of them. So this is the date. You can go look it up. June 23rd, 2009. Don't just say no. You aren't respecting other people's problems. Everyone needs to trust that everyone else is doing their best for the business. You can't prevent failure. Prepare for it. Develop ability to respond to problems quickly and effectively. Ops provide constructive feedback on current aches and pains. So this is all the stuff John and Paul were saying to each other. And I was already working on this format to do, because I'd met, I'd met Patrick in the Agile conference in 2008 in Toronto, and at the time I was working on Puppet, and I was talking about how Agile could be applied to infrastructure, and he'd written a paper about applying Scrum to system administration, and we were like, we gotta have a conference to get Dev and Ops together, and then after I tweeted that, the next day he's like, we're calling it DevOps Days. And that's the, that's the beginning of the, the buzzword. Madness. But I think it's, it, you got to understand the context. DevOps did not start in 2009. That's, that's absurd. This is an a interview from Werner Vogels in 2006 where he's saying, I'll, I'll just read it, I'll read it slow. So the traditional model is that you take your software to the wall that separates development and operations and throw it over and then forget about it. Not at Amazon. You build it, you run it. We're going to come back to that, so remember that. You build it, you run it. Has anyone ever heard someone say that before? You build it, you run it? That's the most misunderstood quote in the universe. So, you build it, you run it. This brings developers into contact with the day-to-day -day operation of their software. It also brings them into day-to-day -day contact with the customer. This customer feedback loop is essential for improving the quality of service. That's 2006, so that's three years before DevOps is a word, but that sounds suspiciously like what we've been talking about for 15 years. This is from 2007. So this is a blog post that was on O'Reilly Radar, or O'Reilly Radar, which I'm not sure they still have it available. I was looking around, and I think they changed their O'Reilly's going through some midlife crisis. I think they took some of their blogs down. But this is guy, the guy who was working at Amazon at the time, who was a co-founder of Chef, which is a project some of you might have heard of, and he wrote about how operations is the secret sauce of startups, arguing that. If you do traditional operations that you have a lot more hours of work to do than if you do this new way with configuration management tools. And this is 2007, so just think about with all the platforms, Kubernetes and the rest of the container stuff, it's evolved like you could even get better efficiencies. This is slides I used to do all the time, 2008, talking about Puppet. It's a very similar metaphor, Dev and Ops throwing it over the wall. All they, do is, all they do to communicate is they have a ticket system that makes people unhappy or worse. And that, that, like, these are the exact slides I used to give in 2008. And then this book was written, so you'll see John Allspaugh, Jesse Robbins are the authors on the cover. I'm an author, Patrick Dubois is an author. This book came out in 2009, so DevOps is not a word yet, not quite yet. So what I'd like to argue is that you have 2006 is before cloud. So that's the year that EC2 and all the Amazon services started getting released. So that's BC. And then you have some weird magic stuff happens in three years. And then 2009, you have after DevOps. So that's like 80. That's where we live now. But I was never, I was never interested in like a, a process. Like we need a process. No, I was interested in winning. And I used to give this slide in a lot of talks. I'm trying to, for obvious reasons, or hopefully they're obvious to other people, I'm trying to use less war metaphors in my talks recently because I don't really want to have a war or have big wars, but uh, this, this used to be a model or metaphor for how technology changes 
the game, right? Like the game changes and then you can't do the same thing because that tool changed what you could do. Every, I'm, some people probably know what this is. Yes? You know this story? So for a long time, people were like, oh, we need, a, we need a definition for DevOps, or we can't do it. It's not defined well enough, which was always silly. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make it clear how silly I think this is. But this was a definition that I just started using because I think it makes sense to me. It's also going to connect to the socio-technical stuff we're about to do. So for my simple definition of DevOps, it's about optimizing the human experience and performance of operating software. So that's like the life cycle, deployment, management, all these things with software. So you need some tools and humans as a key component. But what should we do? We should, we should sip tea. This is the problem with DevOps, with, with everything really. Because you have all these things that people stood on stage and they, they talked about, oh, doing deploys 10 times per day at Flickr. But the problem that John and, and uh, Paul were trying to solve at Flickr was how could you put more cat pictures on the internet? And that's a very different problem than all the other software that we need to do. Right? When you start talking about people's money or life and death, the minimum viable process is different for each of those domains. So this, I heard a lot for 15 years. It's like, we don't know what to do because DevOps didn't give us exact checklists of the steps that we need to do to be doing DevOps. It's like, okay. Then someone wrote a book, and then they told you exactly what they do, and everyone's like, we can't do that. Okay. Continuously DevOps microservice platforms. It's like you could just check off all the bingo, bingo cards. You know bingo? You play bingo here? With software and humans. The, the full buzzword compliance. I, I was having a discussion this morning with someone who's frustrated because their executives have got the message that DevOps is dead and now it's, it's platform engineering and AI. It's like, well, you get, you get the DevOps you deserve, I think is the way I would say that. This is, this is me in a lot of those conversations. So I'm gonna go, now we're gonna get into this socio-technical system stuff, which I think is really fascinating. I'm, I think it's fascinating for a few reasons. One, because of what was studied and when, and then, based on what happened and the things that they actually proved, what, what was done next, like the next steps, right? Because you think, if you, went to a, if you went into your organization and you promised people things like higher productivity, better quality, you know, lower costs, then everyone would be in favor of that. And, and you'd think even more, if you proved that you could do that, everyone would be in favor of that. It turns out it doesn't always go that way. So Edward Deming is this guy. Does anyone know who Edward Deming is? So if you study like lean, actually if you study DevOps, you'd probably be influenced by Edward Deming. I was definitely influenced by him. He did a bunch of stuff we're going to talk about for a minute, and then he went to Japan. So we're going to talk about that too. So this, I think this is a very kind of DevOps or ops kind of statement. So one gets a good rating for fighting a fire. The result is visible and can be quantified. If you do it right the first time, you are, you are invisible. You're not rewarded if you've never, there's never a fire because no one ever saw you do anything. You're invisible, you satisfy the requirements, that is your job, mess it up and correct it later, you become a hero. So the, this, these are quotes from like the 1950s. So during the Second War, Deming worked as a quality expert in armament plants throughout the United States. So he was into the statistical process control and he thought of everything as this data-driven input and output system, and he came up with ways to increase the, the throughput. So Deming's approach helped to reduce higher quality products while raising productivity and decreasing costs. Like, the data is all there. And 
he's just, he's just, everything's an optimization problem, right? You see the data, can we make it better? Okay, let's try this, oh, it didn't make it better, let's try this other thing, better, 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 better. And then the war ended, and guess what happens? He had all the data, but no one cared. No one cared, at least in the US. So what happens is all the, all the people that were fighting, all the men that were doing the command and control in the army came home and Deming was like, here's how we should run these factories. And they're like, that sounds great for women, but we're not doing that. And we're going back to this command and control stuff because that's what we like, that's what we know. So Deming had to go away. So that might be the end of it. We're going to come back to Deming. He goes to Japan. It ends well. So now we're going to, it's the same time across the, the pond, right? So Deming does this stuff in the US. Then in the United States, in the, or in the British coal mines in the 1950s, this is the birth of socio technical systems theory. So this guy Trist at the Tavistock Institute is studying coal miners. And specifically, what he's studying is the organizational model. So, so what he's, he's against, which some of you might experience in your enterprise IT systems, is the organizational model that fused Weber's description of bureaucracy with Frederick Taylor's concept of scientific management that had become pervasive. So everything is about all these structures, systems, time. It, it, does anyone ever study Taylorism or any, does it, any of these words make any sense to you? It's like interesting to see the evolution of all these ideas. But there's this alternative that they, that they saw in this one mine, the Haymore mine. And just to kind of make a graphical representation, there's, there's this investment from the central planning, the supervisors, in automating the coal mines. And that new method with the automation is called long wall mining. And the way that it works is you have these, these big machines that shear off the coal, and then in shifts, eight hour shifts, they change. And then there's the short wall mining, which is kind of like continuously deployed microservices. So what do you think is better from the data? So in the long wall mining, every shift works with a single task. One, sh one shift would be tasked with moving the conveyor belts, another loading the coal, and so on. So no one could see everything. No one saw the whole process. They only saw their individual work. And there's no good signaling communication for the handoff. So what do you think happens? On paper, by the, by the numbers that the central planners thought they would get, the long wall mining system should be much more productive than the short wall system. In reality, the expected productivity did not develop. In fact, it's worse than that. They got lower uh, morale and safety in addition to not getting any productivity. So the beginning of social technical systems theory is really summarized in this statement. The quality of any organizational system can only be understood and improved if the social and the technical are both considered interdependent parts of a single system. So if you just bring in a new tool, but you don't, un you don't bring the people into that new social fabric of using that tool the right way, then you're not gonna get better. So it, the magic wand of, of DevOps vendors or, or whatever platform engineering orchestrators not going to solve this problem if you don't actually have a way to change the way people work with those tools. So I'm not going to read all these, but I just think it's, it's fascinating that this was written down in the 1950s, right? So this is the principles of the new way, the new principles of the social technical system. The work system, which comprised a set of activities that made up a functioning whole, now became the basic unit rather than the single jobs. Right? So the Taylorism model is all these jobs are kind of connected together, but no one really has that full picture. What, here's, what they're saying in this new system is that that whole system of work should be connected with feedback loops in the social system. The work group became central rather than the individual job holder. That's a continuation of the same thing. Internal regulation of the system by the group was thus rendered possible rather than the external regulation of individuals by supervisors. So this is kind of the empowered team, right? This is the self-organizing team became possible and, and documented in the 1950s. 
uh, redundancy of function rather than the redundancy of parts. So this is that individuals increase the response repertoire of the group by developing multiple skills. So it's not that any one person would necessarily have to do every single job, but you had enough context to what was coming in and coming out that you could make good decisions because you understood their context too. Discretionary rather than prescribed parts of the work role. So I think this is a problem I see in a lot of organizations where everything's pretty much on fire, uh, nothing is really, really working, but everyone's doing their job. Everyone's meeting their KPIs and blaming everyone else for why it's not working because no one's filling in the gaps. No one's filling in the communication gaps or the handoffs between those roles. And, and this is, I didn't put this explicitly here, but I have a theory that every single company, every single organization from the lowest level to the highest level is held together by people who have the conscience to do the work that's not their job. If, if everyone in every, every company just did their job, everything would fall apart. Variety increasing for the individual and organization rather than blah, blah, blah. This is the paper. This is like their paper from the 1950s. So the old paradigm was about the technological imperative. The new paradigm is about joint op optimization between the social and technical. The old paradigm is man as an extension of the machine. The new paradigm is man is complementary to the machine. Blah, 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 down to the bottom. Low risk taking is the old paradigm. Innovation. Everyone wants that, right? This is from the 1950s. Who wouldn't want some innovation? So increased productivity, higher morale, and better safety. Everyone wants that, right? Everyone wants that. They got the data. No, they didn't want it. They, they published this, and it went back to the divisional board of the supervisors. We're like, uh-uh, we're not doing that. We will not be empowering workers. That is not happening. So within a year or two, the conventional system reinstated itself. And I'll, I'll give you these. I don't want to read this um, for today. But basically what happens is the, the directors were not interested in empowering the workers. They didn't really care if there was better productivity, higher whatever, better safety, better morale. They didn't care. Um, and then they, they compounded the issue with the, the long wall mining by giving uh, special pay incentives for the people that use this tool different than this tool. And so that fractioned the, fractured the social fabric of the, the work groups and the conventional system reinstated itself. And gr so granting more autonomy was not popular by the supervisors. Then it, it really, really dies because the, they, they, they had enough data to show, okay, like, this is actually better, this is actually working, but the energy shift from coal dominant to oil dominant made it easy to disregard because then they would just say, oh, that's for coal. We don't care. Now, we're, now we do oil. So like it had to start over. I feel like that's, that's the lesson that even if you prove that could be better, every time there's a small change, then the autocrats come, they take it all away, and they say, oh, that was for them. That's for that other context. Now we're doing this new thing. And then another, in the continuation of the social technical systems theory, and this is a continuous uh, line of research, and I actually did a naive Google search of Turkish socio technical systems theory, and I found some pretty interesting papers. I didn't have time to digest all of them and put them into the middle of this, but I think since then up to, till now, there's a bunch of uh, stuff. There's a, some really good stuff from the 70s and 90s in the, the Dutch. They did a bunch of social technical system stuff. Anyway, the Tavistock conclusion is that anonymous groups do not always succeed. Like just because you give a group autonomy, they won't succeed if they don't have that support from the surrounding organization. So if you just create this little special pocket, you see this actually all the time in sort of like special DevOps things is you make special rules for this group over here and they kind of prove that it works, but everything they're doing has no possible way of coming back into the business as usual. And in fact, the people over here now hate these people because they got special rules. So innovations are not likely to survive unless the organization has a whole change. The whole organism has to change. The whole social fabric has to change to use the new tools, to use the new innovations. This is uh, one of my friend's favorite DevOps metric, the mean time to leadership change. So if you have, if you have a successful initiative, but then you get a new boss, and he doesn't like whatever the old boss did, 
they might repave it just because it's not their work. Now we're gonna go back to Deming. So the only reason we know about Deming is because he went to Japan. So he had all the success in the US. They didn't want to listen to him. He ends up in Japan. And then in the 80s, there's this video, which you can go watch the whole thing on YouTube, where he says, I think that people here expect miracles. American managements think they can just copy from Japan, but they don't know what to copy. So without Deming, there'd be no Toyota, there'd be no Lean, there'd be no DevOps, period. So American executives visited Japanese factories. So this is like the 60s now. And they thought the Japanese were hiding the truth because they couldn't conceive of just-in-time manufacturing. They couldn't believe that you could have this, these cars without the inventory. They needed to see these lots of the cars and they, they, they thought the Japanese were lying to them. They thought they were just putting on a show. And then GM, because they started, getting, they started losing market share, they decided to invest in automation. We're going to get the robots. We're going we're to get the, the platform engineering people in here, and they're going to make it all, all better. And, and what they did, and I, I won't read the whole thing again, but they, they shelled out an eye-popping $45 billion in capital. And despite that spending, its global market share rose by but a single percentage to 22%, 22%. For the same amount of money, we could have bought Toyota and Nissan outright. So they, they spent all this money on robots to have no impact when they could have bought the, the uh, excuse me, competition for the same amount of money. These are quotes from GM executives. Quality suffered because instead of making flawless cars, workers simply did their assigned jobs. Workers had no big picture goal of building cars together to motivate them. It's not about doing your job, it's about getting the outcome, the collective outcome. Focusing on the technical without accounting for the socio never goes very well. All you do is automate confusion. So you can find these quotes in these articles about GM from uh, comments on the Deming stuff. So optimizing flow is the work of smoothing the boundaries between tasks and teams. You have structures, you have tools, you have stories, narratives. If people don't buy into the narrative, they're gonna have a hard time doing the work. They have to believe this story. And then I think this is a thing that we do wrong in a lot of cases, that we avoid conflict. The optimization of the system comes from the conflict. It comes from having productive conflict between the interests of the dev and the interests of the ops. If your platform is all about making developers more productive, but not about making operations more efficient, you're gonna have a bad time, I guarantee you. Ongoing negotiation to establish that common ground. Everyone should not undertake every task. I used to just like have convulsions when people say DevOps means everyone does everything. That's never been a good idea. I never thought that was a good idea. But everyone should understand the value that the others contribute. So this is my little, I call it the three layer cake model. It also conveniently maps to the NIST definitions of cloud computing. So what I believe, the as-a-service operating model, everyone wants software, right? And I believe software is optimally delivered on what looks suspiciously like a platform, and that needs to be running on what looks suspiciously like infrastructure as a service. Each of those is now software that is running as a service, so each of those needs to be developed and operated. If you don't have an understanding, I, I had this conversation over and over, from Puppet to Cloud Foundry to Kubernetes, where people are shocked about the ongoing cost of maintaining their platform, about the ongoing operational burden of these platforms. So if you haven't accounted and, and, and funded and supported and sponsored that side of it, then you're gonna have a bad time. But it's also, keep in mind, each of these, the goal is to keep them laminar or, or like connected to each other, but not necessarily coupled to each other. You want to be able to independently change them from each other. So how many people think about CICD for their infrastructure as a service? How many people think about CICD for their platform, which is software? That's just as critical as the software at the top. 
So the traditional model is that you take your software to the wall that separates development operations. We already said this quote, right? You build it, you run it. Werner Vogels, 2006. Here's the thing. When Werner Vogel says that in 2006, they already have APIs to provision infrastructure. They've had them for years. They have APIs to provision databases. They have APIs to do deployments. So when Werner Vogel says that in 2006, he does not mean that that team is doing all this work on their operating systems. He means they're running that top layer, right? Not the rest of it. That is already in place at Amazon in 2006. This is a Be the Bezos memo, very famous from 2002, where I'll, I won't read the whole thing, but I'm going to read the top and the bottom. All teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Teams must communicate with each other through these interfaces. So the CEO said, we're going to do everything as a service. And then the very last line is, anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. That's, just, that's the CIO level or CEO level sponsorship. And th these didn't come because someone sat down one day and said, we're going to do DevOps or, or we're going to do SRE. It came because of the pressure to deliver high feature velocity and reliability at scale. No, no, one's, no one did this by committee, is the pressure. So this is a little bit of my gratuitous propaganda for how I like to think about it. But each of these are layers that have a different natural pace and you want to keep them all pointed in the same direction and you need to integrate them, both the technical and the social side of it. So this is slides I used to use all the time for arguing why you, microservices were less risk, but more and more I realized that this is also about integrating the social system, that you need to have the right cadence to communicate across the capabilities of your organization so you're not surprising each other when you start to change the, the interfaces. This is like ergonomic propaganda stuff, but you basically have, if you imagine an org chart, then you have the top down is the simplest. It's like, do it this way. Then you also want to have the feedback loop, because another, another danger is that you get disconnect between the executives and the practitioners, right? So this is what I call the watermelon reporting. So everything's red because everything's on fire. And then by the time it gets to the executives, it's all green. It's like, oh, everything's fine, right? So you got to have some honesty and feedback. But then the real magic, in my opinion, comes when you have peer level alignment across the capabilities of your organization. So you could think about this as like, you know, dev, ops, security, compliance, whatever. You need these peer level alignment for the, for the real workflows to come um, and optimize. So everyone wants this when they haven't got this or even this. And everyone wants this. They created a new silo for this and they want to pretend this doesn't exist. That's the, the common platform. Uh, if this was easy, everyone would be good about now. I asked uh, uh, AI to make me a platform for operating software, and this is what it gave me, so it's clearly hard. So we're, we're coming to the last mile. Everyone wants DevOps. Here's what they actually want. Here's what most of you probably want. Reliability, availability, scalability, operability, usability, observability, all for free without changing anything. So then just to make that, we'll make it really big without changing anything. That's what most organizations are struggling with. And performance almost always goes down before it goes up. So this is, this is, you know this from your own, if you try to ever learn a skill, when you get the new skill, you actually get worse, and then you go back up. So lots of people start this, this well-intentioned DevOps initiative, and then it dies at the bottom, and they never get out of the thing because they don't have the social capital to get to their side of that dip. And then coming to the very, very end, there's an issue in the, in the market where the early adopters are actually looking for that advantage. They're trying to win a game. And they get that advantage because they're trying to win a game. And then later, this is why people just adopt the words with nothing else, because they're not actually trying to win. They're just trying to be legitimate. They're just trying to be the cool kids. They, they like change all, all their titles to DevOps, and they change them to SRE, and then they change the platform engineer. They didn't change anything else. Because the words cross the chasm before the understanding of practices, we're almost to the end. So autonomous teams outperform command and control, but only when empowered. Joint optimization with the social maximizes the value of the technical. Everyone doesn't need to do everyone's job. They just need to value the interdependence. 
We can't just copy because we don't know what to copy. We have to solve it for our context. Change is hard. I think this is funny. I'll let you look at it for two seconds. A bad system will beat a good person every time. It is not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. Edward Deming, this isn't a technical problem. This isn't a people problem. You have to solve both together. This is my definition of DevOps. Software, software, software. Humans, humans, humans. Learning is the only sustainable advantage. You haven't learned anything until you change your behavior. You're, not, you're not, not here to just collect words. You're not here to just collect the ideas. You have to change the behavior. Do not copy. Seek the advantage. Thank you.